Good afternoon. It's wonderful to have you here. Hi, Karen and Tammy. I think, let me look. No, now Naftali's with us. Hi, Naftali. It's really good to have you here this afternoon. I'm really missing being together, but it's good that we can be together over Facebook and on Zoom also. So we will be having our Bible study tonight at 7 p.m. over Zoom. And I think you have the link there on the Grace Covenant Church private page if you go there. Again, it's uh, wonderful to have you here on this beautiful, sunny summer day. Summer has started. Let's begin with prayer. Father, just now thank you for this day. I thank you for the gift of life, Lord. I thank you that while we were yet in our mother's womb, you knit us together. You fashioned our DNA. You made us unique in all of creation. You made us in the image of God. And now, Lord, you are making us, remaking us in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are being transformed one, from one degree of glory to another into the very image of Christ. And this comes from your Spirit, who is the Lord. Father, I thank you for the ministry of the Spirit. I again pray that you would fill us with an extraordinary measure of your Spirit today. And I pray that you would do that throughout this day and throughout tomorrow and the rest of the week and even through the rest of the month, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, for the friendship, for the constant companionship that you never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for giving himself up on the cross for us. For stepping forth from the tomb so that we might be saved and live. For ascending so that your spirit might be given after his blood was presented in the real Holy of Holies. You are so good and so kind and so loving. I pray that you would open the world's eyes to see your glory, who you really are. Open our eyes as well, Lord. Father, I read some news this morning and haven't verified it yet, but it looks like the numbers are rising rapidly now as we open in various states, in Arizona and Texas and Father, I pray that you would keep all of those in our families and those who regularly attend our church and all of our friends overseas and all around the states, Lord, you would keep us all safe. I pray that you would bring this pandemic quickly to an end. And yet we know you are allowing it out of your great love for this world. And so whatever work you're doing, Lord, Bring it to fruition. Bring it to completion. <clears throat> if things need to get worse before they get better, then, Lord, so be it. We ask not for our will. We ask your will be done. I pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. That's our prayer, Lord, is your kingdom come, your will be done. Thank you that we have eternal hope, Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not because of works, not because of what we've done. 
but because of your great love and your kindness and your great mercy out of which you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to give up his life. Help us to look away from ourselves and remember two things, that Jesus gave himself up for us and he loves us. Jesus loves us and he loves us to the extent that he gave himself up for us. I pray for our nation, Lord. I pray for the leadership nationally, for President Trump, for the Senate and House, for Nancy Pelosi and for Mitch McConnell. Father, I know this nation is tired of the infighting. I pray they would get back to work. And I pray that you would bring each of these people, if they don't know you, and their families, our fervent prayers that you would bring them to know our Lord Jesus Christ, that they would come into saving faith, that they would believe. And that would include President Trump's cabinet, all the senators, all the House of Representatives, all those in the Supreme Court, Lord. Do whatever it takes in their life to bring them to you so that they can hear the gospel and respond. I pray for the same for our state officials here and in Nevada, New York, Virginia, California, Oregon, every state, Lord. We pray for our governors and our state legislative branch. You would do whatever it takes in each of these people's lives to bring them to a full knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that you would shine the searchlight of your grace and truth, that you would shine the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into their hearts that they might see and freely believe. We pray the same for our county and, and city officials all across, across this nation. And again, I lift up the healthcare workers all around this nation and around the world, Lord, who are still being faced with exposure, working with very, very sick people, seeing this continued death toll take its toll on our nation. Again, we pray for a great awakening, Lord. A great awakening across Europe and the Middle East and Africa, Scandinavia, Russia, China, the Koreas, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Latin America, South America, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, Canada, the US, Hawaii. All these, every country, every nation, every continent, every island, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be poured out in vast measure and you, you would bring an authentic revival, an authentic awakening of people across the globe and an, an authentic revival of the church, Lord. Teach us to be the church. May justice roll down like a mighty river. May your mercy flow to this world. May the power of your grace change human lives. May people discover the peace that passes all understanding. May people find and accept the eternal hope that we have in Christ Jesus. 
We entrust our lives, our cities, our counties, our states, our nation, and the countries of the world into your hands, Lord. Do your good work, Lord. We give you praise. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we come to Psalm 34. It's a Psalm of David again, and I'm going to read through it. Let me get to the title screen here. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. The title, this is actually part of the Hebrew text. It says, A Psalm of David, when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. And as you're going to see, it's an acrostic psalm. We do this all the time. Uh, we start one line with the A and then the next line with a, a word that starts with B. The third line which starts with C. We also have acrostics like we will do a sermon with all R's. Redemption, regeneration, repentance, and so on. And so this is an acrostic psalm. There's 22 verses and there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So it fits perfectly almost, you'll see, as we go through that there's an anomaly in it. And the anomaly, I'll save it for the end, it's uh, very interesting. It tells us what this psalm is about. So let's read together. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 22. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who, fears him, who fear him and rescues them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The voice of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save, saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So again, we have a Psalm of David, and it says in the title, When he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. If you actually go into 1 Samuel, we're going to be reading this story just here in a minute. It's a, a chis, or a chis, I think, is the name of the king. I'll, I'll get to it there. I'll read it correctly when we get there. But people have speculated, well, this says Abimelech. There's an error here. But Abimelech appears to be a title of the Philistine kings. And so there was a lot of Abimelechs, not just one. And so this appears to be the title of that Philistine king. And then we will come upon his name coming up. And so it says, A Psalm of David, when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. There's some debate about whether this psalm really fits that. 
it fits it like a glove, as we'll see. It's, it's a wonderful psalm. Again, it's an acrostic psalm, and you saw I had the Hebrew letters there. There's not actually a letter before each verse. It's that each word that begins the verse starts with that letter. And so this was a means of helping people memorize things. In an oral, oral cult culture, they had scripture by memorizing it because scrolls were very costly. Not everybody had that kind of money to, to purchase a scroll. They were copied by hand by teams of scribes who were very careful in, in counting the letters even to make sure they were accurate. And so this was a mnemonic advice, a memory device to memorize the psalm. Interesting enough, one letter is missing from the psalm, and we'll see that coming up. And in place of that letter missing, there is a, an additional occurrence of the letter P, the Hebrew letter Pe, or Pe, uh, at the very end of the psalm, and we'll see why. It, it's, um, I love the way that the Holy Spirit, through David, penned this psalm, but wove in the actual center of what's being said in this psalm. So let's begin. I'm going to read this, this, the, the story about when David feigned madness, and I'm going to read the whole thing. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 15. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through, 1 through 15, and then we're going to be catching the first two verses of, 2 Samuel, or of 1 Samuel chapter 22. So again, 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 15. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech. This is a different guy. This is a priest. To Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? Remember, this is after David had killed Goliath. He was known to be uh, quite the warrior by this time, even though he had been a servant in Saul, Saul's house. I'm not, it doesn't tell us why Ahimelech is afraid, but maybe he thinks that David is coming as a re representative of Saul and is coming to do him harm. It doesn't tell us. David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with the matter and has, has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter which I am sending you and with which I have commissioned you. And I have directed young men to a certain place. Everything David just said there is a lie. It's not true. David is in the, in, has just left Jonathan. It, the, the previous chapter is where Jonathan has agreed to meet David. He's going to find out whether Saul is intent on killing David. And I think that's one of the scenes where Saul throws a spear at Jonathan and, and it uh, goes into the wall next to Jonathan. So Jonathan is met with David out in the field and it's that account where the little boy is sent out to, to pick up the arrows and Jonathan says to David, if I shoot them beyond you or beyond the little boy, then and I call to him, they are beyond you, then you will know that Saul is out to take your life. And so now, Jonathan has come out to the field with the little boy, sent him out into the field and shot the arrows beyond the little boy. And he calls out, you'll find them beyond you. And so David knows now that Saul is intent on killing him. So he flees right on the spot. He flees. He doesn't get to go home. He doesn't get to pick up clothing. He doesn't get to pick up any weapons or any food. He just flees with the, with the clothes on his back. We often don't think of King David as homeless or as extremely poor as a pauper. Here he is, homeless and without anything but the clothes on his back. So then he comes to him, Ahimelech, and he doesn't want Ahimelech to know why he's really there. So he lies to the priest, deceives the priest. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. He's hungry and he knows he's going to need some food. Continuing in verses 4 and 5, the priest answered David and said, there, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. 
David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us, as previously when I set out and set out and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey, how much more than today? Well, David again is lying, because he's not with any young men. He's on his own, fleeing Saul's wrath, this murderous wrath. And so the consecrated consecrated bread that was part of the tabernacle or, or set out before the Ark of the Covenant. We're not sure where this was, if the Ark was actually here. But that consecrated bread could only be eaten by people who were purified, who had kept themselves pure. And if you had been with a woman, that puts you into, I think, a seven-day state of uncleanliness, how they saw it. Kind of a strange story. But David is deceiving this priest all the way through. The young men surely have, have not slept with their wives is what he's getting at. Then in 6, six through 8, it says, So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord. So I imagine the ark had to be there in this place. And again, we have the Lord, Yahweh, capital letters. I, I go through this almost every day, but it's the name Yahweh. And we know that Jesus declared himself to be Yahweh in John 8, 58, when he says, before Abraham was, I am. And this name Lord, uh, Yahweh, is connected to I am who I am back in Exodus chapter 3. So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Now one of the servants of Saul was there that, that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. So Doeg was there, worshiping before the Lord, being detained, I'm not sure why, but the Lord maybe was communicating to him, I'm not sure. David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? Because Doeg is there and he's Saul's chief shepherd, he thinks that maybe Doeg might be seeking to, to take his life as well. For I brought neither sword, neither my sword nor my, nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. So I, I left in such a hurry that I forgot my sword and my dagger and whatever else. If I was a priest, I'd be getting a little suspicious about now, David without his weapons. But nevertheless, then the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistines, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it. So this is a sword that had been David's. He had cut off he had killed Goliath with the sling, with the stone to the forehead. Then he had taken Goliath's own sword and had cut off his head. It must have been a very large sword because Goliath was a very large man. Then David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. It's Achish. And apparently he took the sword of, of Goliath with him. It would have been a well-known sword because of its size and because of that battle. It would have been well-known from both sides. Everybody had seen Goliath on the Philistine. He was a Philistine. And so when David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath, Achish is the king, Gath is, a, is one of the five prominent cities of the Philistines. So he's going to the very people who, of whom Goliath had been a soldier. He's going to the enemy to, to seek safety. And he's coming with Goliath's sword. That's, that's audacious. That's dangerous. He's almost thumbing his nose in, in, in their face to bring the sword of Goliath with him. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands? But David, his tens of thousands, or ten thousands, I think that was after the uh, battle with the Philistines, or, or maybe thereafter. 
David took these words to heart and greatly fe feared Achish, king of Gath. Israel and the Philistines were sworn bitter enemies. David was the one who killed their champion. David is the one who cut off their champion's head and then routed the Philistines that day. So now David is in a catch-22, caught between murderous Saul and the king of Gath, or the king of Gath, named Achish, or Achish. What's he going to do? Achish would be happy to kill him. Saul would, is seeking to kill him. So he disguised his sanity before them. So David disguised his sanity before the king of Achish, or the king Achish and the people of Gath, and acted insanely in their hands, and scribbled on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva run down his beard. I thought about giving an illustration, but I thought better of it. You do not want to see that. This is a crafty move. He's, he's feigning that he's gone mad. And that's why he's come to the Philistines. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman or the madman in my presence? That's a mouthful. Madmen, mad, madman. Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? Akish is saying, don't bother me with this. I have enough fools in my, own, in my own city to have to deal with another one, somebody who's out of their head. And as a result, David is untouched by King Akish. And then we go to chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. So de David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam, and when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. So that would include David's seven brothers, his father, uh, and all their servants. Everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. And this is that famed army of David, just 400 men. All of Israel comes against David later with, when his son Absalom turns against him. And these 400 men led by David rout that army. These become guerrilla fighters. They hide in caves. And, and notice again, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. We'll see this reflected in the psalm. Now let's take a look at the psalm. That's the background story of this psalm. So we begin again, we have Aleph, Beth, Gimel. Those are the letters in order of the Hebrew al alphabet. Gimel is a G, but it occurs third in, in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is a letter they didn't pronounce. Beit or Beth. It's usually pronounced Beit, Beit, I think. Uh, and so all through the psalm, you have this acrostic going to help people memorize it. And so we begin, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He's escaped Saul, and now he's escaped King Achish and the people of Gath. And so his first response in his deliverance, some people think that this was written in the cave of Adullam. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. We tend to bless the Lord in good times. And in bad times, we tend to question him or respond to him in anger. Or a lot of times, we just remain silent. We don't say anything. But David has discovered a secret. I will bless the Lord, which is another way of saying I, I will praise the Lord. 
we don't really bless God in the sense of, well, we can with our own lives, but I will bless the Lord at all times. I will praise the Lord at all times. And who is the Lord again? Yahweh, Jesus. And it's at all times. I think of the verse that says, uh, give thanks in all circumstances. It does not say, that's in Thessalonians, it does not say give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Similarly, here it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will sing his praises in the midst of having cancer. I will bless him when things aren't going well. Last week was a very, very difficult work week. And yet we continue to bless the Lord, continue to praise him. Because we know that our times are in his hands. And whatever purpose there is in the hardship that we're living through, it's because he loves us and his grace is sufficient for us. His praise shall continually be in my mouth at all times. Same idea. My soul will boast in the Lord. Notice David isn't saying that his boast is in himself or in his 400 men. But his boast is in the Lord. I think of those words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and following that say, for consider your calling brethren and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were strong or powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God has chosen the low and despised things, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He chose us for what we were not. For he is a source of your life, for God is a source of your life in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? For God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That just about covers it, everything. And then it says, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts of the Lord. And here we have it. My soul will make its boasts in the Lord. Quoting this, this section. And maybe other sections as well of the Hebrew scriptures. The humble will hear it and re rejoice. Those who are humble... We always think those who are humble are kind of the gentle, quiet people. Actually, the humble are those who recognize who they are in their own sin, in our own weakness, knowing that no good thing comes from the flesh. David's soul makes its boast in the Lord, in Yahweh, in Jesus. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, magnify Yahweh. And we know, oh, magnify Jesus with me. Magnify is to make great, to expand. We use a magnifying glass to blow up the letters so we can see them. To magnify the Lord is to realize how great he is and awesome and uh, uh, splendid he is. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let us exalt the name of the Lord. And we get right back to Exodus 34 where the Lord proclaims his name to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, God. The Lord, the Lord God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, and yet showing loving kindness to thousands of generations but by no means will leave the guilty unpunished, but will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon their children's children, even to the third and fourth generations. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And in Jesus, we find the perfect reflection of this self-revelation of God's character. We see this perfect character lived out 
in Jesus on the cross. Oh, magnify Jesus with me and let us exalt his name together. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then we get into a second section. And again, we continue the acrostic. So now we get D and then the, the hey, Zion, het. There's kind of two H's. The one is uh, said with a guttural. I can't do it very well, so I won't even try. And the verses 4 through 7 say, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So what were David's fears? On the one hand, he had Saul trying to murder him. No food, no weapons, fleeing into the wilderness, fleeing away from Saul. Runs into Doeg, the, the, the shepherd, who was Saul's chief shepherd. Doesn't know if he's going to survive that encounter because he has no weapon. He goes to Gath, the, the Philistine city, and they recognize him and know that he's the one who killed Goliath. And they say to Achish, isn't this the one who killed? Or isn't this David who, who they sung about, who killed tens of thousands? I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. How many of the fears did God deliver David from? All of his fears. And we find that Jesus re delivers us from our fears. It says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And delivered me from all my fears. We don't have to carry our fears. We can turn them over to Jesus at any time. Our anxieties, our worries, our concerns. We worry because we forget to give them to God. We forget that he can carry them and resolve them and solve them much better than we can. They looked to him, to Yahweh, and were radiant. And now he's thinking about his men that have gathered to him, these 400 men. They were poor. They were in debt. They were discontented. But they looked, looked to Yahweh, and they were radiant. When you look to the Lord, when you look to Jesus, you become radiant because you start reflecting his glory. And, and he comes to live within us. So it's not just only our looking away to Yahweh, but it's that his very life is within us. And his Shekinah glory now shines out through our lives. And I love this, and their faces will never be ashamed. These were men who had been rejected by the culture of the day, by the society of the day. These were the men who were on the outs with Saul. And then David says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Before I get there, you'll notice that I have a letter in there. It's the W. It's uh, that Vav. It's letter Vav, Hebrew letter, or Vav. It's been a long time since I studied Hebrew. I used to be able to read it some, but... Without use, it goes right away. But they left out that letter in the acrostic. It just doesn't appear. It's not even there. I, I put it in so you could see that we're missing a letter here. And the question is why? Well, the, the answer is that there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and he needed that last leg letter, the P of the Hebrew alphabet. He needed to put that P at the end, so he had to subtract one letter from out of the middle. And there was one of the Psalms earlier in our study, I don't remember which one it was, Psalm 5 maybe, that was an acrostic psalm, and it also left out the, this same letter, Vav. So then we get to the next verse, it says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. You think about David, well, he wasn't poor, he was king. He was, at this point, he was destitute. He had nothing but the clothes on his back and Goliath's sword, and some loaves of bread given to him by Ahimelech the priest. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Now he's hiding out in, in the cave of a, a Dulem, and 
he knows that God saved him. On the one side, from Saul pursuing him, he had to get out of the country. Saul had spies everywhere. And so he flees into the Philistine country, which is like jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. This is the very man that killed Goliath, and he goes to the Philistines? This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. This poor man cried, and the Lord has heard me. All of us are poor in spirit. We'll be getting there in this psalm. But all of us are impoverished by our sin, by our selfishness, by our rebellion. And yet when we cry out to God, he hears us. When we cry out to Jesus, he hears us and he saves us out of all of our troubles. I think, well, wait a minute. I'm not saved all, out of all my troubles. I still have cancer potentially. I have lots of other troubles in my life. We all do. I know you do. So what does this mean? Well, for us in the eternal scope of things, that would have been temporal and of this earth for David. But for those of us in the new covenant, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in the heavenlies. And so that we, we know that we have become eternal beings and we have been saved out of all of our troubles in the sense of that we are now eternal beings. We still have troubles in our daily, daily life. We know this. Jesus says, in the world you shall have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. But there's a day coming when all of these troubles will come to an end. There will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more grief, no more mourning, no more pain. And it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. There is no account of the angel of the Lord encamping around David although this was a theme that they would use. We find it in the story of Elisha when Elisha goes into the city, and when they come out in the morning, they, they realize they're encamped all around by, um, was it, I don't think it was Ahab, it was um, a neighboring uh, king and his troops. And they come back and tell Elisha, we're all we're encamped around by these this foreign enemy, they've got us. And then Elisha says, go out and take another look. And they go out and they see, God opens their eyes to see the host of heaven, the, ar the angel armies surrounding, and they know they are secure. So David, at some point, must have realized, God revealed to him that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. That, that word fear does not mean the kind of fear that we have of punishment or the fear of harm because look above at the top at verse 4 and delivered me from all my fears if he's all delivered me of all my fears then how can i fear god because it's a different sense of the word it's that reverential awe when you go up on mount rainier we drive up to paradise sometimes and we walk up the mountain sometimes um up to i forget the name of that point it's beautiful up there but we're looking across at this giant glacier coming down the mountain. And you see avalanches happening right before your eyes sometimes. I was on the other side, on the north side, when I saw an avalanche come off of Willis Wall, which is a 3,000-foot cliff on the north face of Mount Rainier. And this giant avalanche came down the mountain and covered that whole face of a 3,000 foot cliff in snow as it fell. And my cousin Mark and I just were sitting, standing there going, we were in awe of the power, the, the beauty, the grandeur of this mountain. That's that word. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Yahweh, who fear Jesus. And it doesn't mean being afraid of him, it means being in awe of him, of his power and his goodness and of his grace and of his love. This is an encouragement to me because I have that reverence, reverence for Jesus, for God. And I know you have that reverence for him. You've entrusted your life to him. In our context, those who fear him would be those who have believed, who have taken his word at face value and believed. And so the angel of the Lord encamps around us. 
I can't see them, but they're here. I remember a member of our church named Earl Kinney back in the 40s, I think it was. He was, or 50s maybe it was. He was working as a rare, uh, bridge builder for the railroad, and he fell off the bridge. He didn't have any safety on, and he fell 40 feet and landed. Instead of landing in the river, he landed on the rock, bedrock next to the river. And because the sides of the cliff or of the canyon where the river was in, the bridge was being put over the top of this canyon. It was the walls were so steep, the men had to travel way down river or way up river. I don't remember which it was to get to him. So it took over a half an hour for them to to reach Earl. And the whole time Earl was laying on the ground, and he was conscious, awake. He couldn't move because he had broken bones. There was an angel standing over him, and he could see the angel. Earl was not a man to lie. Sometimes I think we entertain angels unawares. I have my own stories of that, but we won't go into that. What encouragement that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. If that was true in the old covenant, how much more true is it of those of us in the new covenant who have entrusted our lives to him? And he rescues them. He rescued David. He rescued David's men. He will yet rescue David's men. Does this mean that we'll never have trouble? We'll never have illness? We'll, we'll be relieved of every trouble in our life? No, Jesus makes that clear. In that passage I quote so often, I love that passage, we have this treasure of the ministry of the Spirit, of the indwelling Christ in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We have the power of Christ, but it doesn't belong to us. It's God's. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies, may be revealed to those around us in our bodies. That doesn't sound to me like a life without trouble. That says that we will be living a life of affliction. We will be perplexed. We will be persecuted. And sometimes we'll be struck down. Always carrying in our bodies the death of Jesus. Paul knew that full well. Tradition tells us he was beheaded. Tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. James was beheaded. John was boiled in oil, apparently, by tradition, but survived it. And we move on in the psalm to the next section, Psalm 34, verses 8 through 10. These are off-quoted words. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now he's turning to the audience, to his audience and maybe to his men in the cave in, in that context. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good, that Jesus is good. It's, it's kind of a strange thing because he's, he's saying, come and try it. Come and see. Come and take a taste. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Oh, taste and see that Jesus is good. We're told that he's sweeter than honey. I have tasted of the Lord, and at first I thought it was a, a bitter a pill to take because the Lord that they were telling me about wasn't the, wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. But at age 23, I, I met the Jesus of the Bible. I tasted of his grace and of his love, his unconditional, immeasurable, boundless, infinite love. And the power of his grace, which is always sufficient for us. And it is better than any food I've ever tasted. Better than every, any beverage, better than any drink. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in him. David was not taking refuge he couldn't take refuge in Israel because Saul was pursuing him. He couldn't take refuge in the Philistine nation because Achish 
would have killed him. He's taken refuge in a, in a cave, impoverished, without food, hardly. Just one sword. And yet in that place, in that very, very hard place, no bed, no blankets, maybe just enough to build a fire. He takes refuge in Yahweh. In the midst of these really hard times is what it's getting at. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Whatever is going on in your life that is so troubling to you, maybe it's a pandemic, but maybe it's other things like poverty or, or um, being without a home or it may, might be an illness, cancer or liver disease. old age, in the middle of these difficult times, that's when he's saying, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because usually we think, man, he's, I've done something. He's out to get me now. That's why all this is happening to me, because what sin is it that I committed that I have cancer over? I, I know people have actually suggested that to me. Well, I know there's sin in my life. There's always been sin in my life. I don't relish, I don't glory in it. I am a work in progress as you are a work in progress. But how blessed is the man, how blessed is the woman who takes refuge in him. Have you taken refuge in Jesus? Have you taken refuge in Yahweh? It goes on and says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him, there is no want. And again, this isn't that word of fear that involves punishment or the fear of terror or the fear of harm. It's that reverential, awestruck fear, the fear of wonder, the fear of being amazed. Throughout the Gospels, we hear the word, and they were amazed over and over again. Oh, be amazed before the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. Well, this is spoken to the Israelites in the New Covenant, we know that there is want. Paul says, and I think it's Philippians, I have learned the secret of contentment, whether in want or in plenty. I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We take that verse out of context. We think it means like the American, I can do it. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. In the context, that's not what it's saying. It's I can face any circumstances I any circumstance I find myself in through Christ who strengthens me. I realized early in this illness that I did not have it what it takes to face this illness. I lost both parents to cancer. My mother had a grueling battle with it over three years. My dad went very quickly and died a violent death. And when I got the diagnosis, I, I knew, Lord, I can't do this. But I've learned the secret of contentment. I can face all circumstances through, through Christ, through Yahweh, through Jesus, who strengthens me. My strength is never in myself. That's the American way. Be strong in yourself. Believe in yourself. And so this is a command here for us to reverentially fear God, for us to be awestruck by him, to remember how great he is, that he is the one who threw out the universe, who can measure it by the palm of his hand, who holds the sun and the moons and all the planets and galaxies. And he holds all things together. And then it says, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. And, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. And here we have a contrast. The young lions are those young men who are violent, who are ready to tear people apart. He's not talking about law-abiding, Moses law-abiding, or God-fearing people. He's talking about people who are rebellious, young men who are rebellious, out there just doing their own thing. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. They're going to end up without provision because of the, their lifestyle. But they who seek the Lord, they who seek Yahweh, shall not be want of any good thing. As I have said in the Old Covenant, 
that not being want of any good thing was a temporal thing, a physical thing. In the New Covenant, there are people around this world who are Christians who are in want of many good things. But remember, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Let me ask you, which is better, a physical blessing or a spiritual blessing? We naturally think that physical blessings are better. That's what the prosperity gospel is based on, is, is promises from the Old Covenant applied to the New Covenant. And for some reason, we think that wealth and all those things will make us happier and make us better. But the reality is spiritual things are eternal. Those temporal blessings, those physical blessings are just that. They're temporal, meaning time-bound. They will come to an end. The rust will set in. The moths will eat. But the spiritual blessings have no end. They are eternal blessings. And we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies for all eternity. Wow. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Moving on, 11 through 14. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So now we come, we take a turn in the psalm, and now he's going to teach us the fear of the Lord, what it means to fear the Lord, that reverential fear. And I love this. He says, come, you children, listen to me. He's not speaking literally to children, but to his men and to the Israelites later on in his life. Who is a man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Again, we're talking and reading a text under the Old Covenant. So we're talking about, again, those physical blessings, physical life. We have something much better than the length of days. We have e the gift of eternal life. They had it too. They, they just didn't have it well clarified for them by faith. They had it. Who is a man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? And then you want to live a long life, David says, then do these things. Keep your tongue from evil. Yes, I do. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. I've lost it already here. In my early, earlier days, I spoke evil all the time. Every other word was evil out of my mouth. And I was a liar by nature in college all through those, all through those years, even into my junior high and, and high school years. I suppose children who have been abused learn to lie. That doesn't excuse it. It's self-protected behavior, but I'd lie to my father. I don't, I'm not proud of that. It says, keep your tongue from evil. Hebrews, or James tells us that a great forest can be set on fire by the tongue, that they are set on fire by hell itself. One who controls his tongue, he controls everything. I know churches that have been absolutely devastated by a gossip speaking evil. It can crush a church. It can destroy a church. And your lips from speaking deceit. That's one of the commandments, do not bear false witness, which would include lying. The only way I know how to do this in a new covenant, there is no good thing that dwells in the flesh. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as our coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is from God. In the new covenant, in Romans chapter 8, it says, By the Spirit of God, you are led of the Spirit if you are putting to death by the Spirit of God the deeds of the flesh. And so part of being led of the Spirit is actually putting to death these things in our life by asking the Holy Spirit to put them to death in us. Meaning that we don't do it out of our flesh because the flesh can never reform flesh. It just makes it worse. It's like telling Congress to reform itself. It doesn't happen. They just keep giving themselves raises. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. If you struggle with this iniquity in your family or in your own life, you can ask God, put to death deceit in me. Put to death gossip and all evil speech from my mouth. And then the next line, depart, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace 
and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. In the New Covenant, we know that seeking peace is not the way we mean it in the world, like peace between nations and peace between people. That's important. But in the New Covenant, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 say, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have obtained access into this grace in which we now stand. Therefore, having been justified by faith, the moment we were justified by, by, justified by faith, we were given peace with God. We're no longer enemies with him. And to pursue peace, then, is to pursue other people coming into that justification by faith so they, too, might have peace with God. And when they have peace with God, then we have peace with each other. To think that there is a real lasting peace beyond that, is short-sighted. And again, we can ask the Holy Spirit to bring us into the fullness of the peace that we have with our God. We move on. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. And again, in the Old, old Covenant, it would be those who were following the law. Saul has completely departed from following the law. David appears, to, well, he is uh, continuing to follow the law at this point. He departs from it severely coming up in the story of Bathsheba and also in the story of the rape of Tamar. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. Who are the righteous in our day? Uh, let me go over to Philippians. I'm going to read this to you so that I don't butcher it. This is one of the clearest texts that tells us who the righteous are. Here we go, Philippians chapter 3. Let me read this to you. It says, um, More than that, I count all things to be in loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's talking about all his credentials, all his merits, everything he has as an Israelite, as, a, as being a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees, all of that. For the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, and that word is excrement, so that I may gain Christ. Have you counted all the good things in your life, all your own righteousness, your own merits, the things you thought you did good for the Lord? Have you counted them but crap or excrement? And then here we go, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, that would be this righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And literally it reads, but that which is through the faith of Christ. And so even my faith isn't in the quality of my faith or the quantity of my faith, but my faith is in the faithfulness of Jesus, in his faith for which he endured the cross. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his, his ears are open to their cry. David and his men were following the law. They were living by God's standard of the day. That standard doesn't change. The moral standard does not change. We just not, are not under the law anymore because the law includes curses and blessings and the penalty of death. Enough said. And his ears are open to their cry. Well, we are the righteous. We receive the righteousness from God, not derived from the law, not a righteousness of our own, but that which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so get this, he hears our cries. He opens our ears to our cries. I've been crying out this week for our friends in Iraq. I've been crying out for the soldiers. I've been crying out for the wife and daughter and the brother and the husband. And Yahweh's ears are open to our cries. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Think of the hundreds of millions of evildoers that have lived and we remember almost none of them. A few of them, Hitler, Mao, Lenin, Jack the Ripper, the notorious ones, the infamous ones. But 
The face of the Lord is set against evil doers. The face of Jesus is set against those who do evil. And yet we know that he loves us. And in the wonder of the cross, he laid down his life for his enemies. And we were his enemies. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That may have been true in David's day. That is true of us, but I think it's true of us only if we see it from the view of eternity. I've seen a lot of troubles in Christians' lives that they don't get delivered out of. My mom died of cancer. Mama died of cancer, and we prayed. I prayed fervently for three years every night, please, Lord, please, Lord, heal her. But that's not the end of the story. She's alive and well. She is in heaven waiting for us. Her last words to me on a tape were, and just think, I'll be waiting for you in heaven. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. In David's case, he, did, he was delivered from being pursued by Saul. He was delivered from the hand of the Philistines. And now his band of 400 men who were in debt and discouraged and brokenhearted, now we're talking about these men. The Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. When I was 23 years old, I went out drinking with my friends, drank seven doubles in 40 minutes, and I don't know if I drank more because I was blacked out, so I don't know how much more I drank, but I blacked out after drinking. The barmaid was having fun and making them extremely stiff, strong. One of my friends forgot his coat at work, and so we met, went back to work to pick up his coat, and I literally went berserk. I was a violent drunk. I was a mean drunk. And I ran into the bakery yelling, screaming, profanities, F this, F that, hitting people, hitting my best friend, overturning equipment, ran out into the street, ran up the hill. My friend Doug, Doug caught me by the hand and I wrenched away and went storming down valley towards Yale and stumbled and hit my head against a curb. They should have taken me to the hospital. I threw up right there. Instead, they just took me home and threw me on my bed. The next morning, I woke up at 10 a.m. in the morning with this huge lump on my head, a grapefruit-sized lump. I got in the shower, showered it. I thought, man, this isn't good. But Then I went to call work, and I went to, to speak, and I couldn't say any words. None. Nothing would come out. My friends had spent the night on the floor. They had been too drunk to drive home. So they saw that I was in really bad shape, so they rushed me to the hospital. As soon as they saw me, they whisked me in to get a CAT scan. Then I was in the ER um, room there when Dr. Lozier came in with his seven or eight residents. And the re residents, they were all recommending, let's drill. I think we need to drill. And Dr. Lozier said, "It's no, we can't drill. It's too late. He's let it um, sit for almost 24 hours or about, what, 16, 18 hours. So all that blood is coagulated. It's not going to work to drill. We'll just have to give him meds. And Dr. Lozier said to me, Grant, I don't think you're going to live, but if you do live, you'll never speak again. Because I had a hematoma in my, in the Broca's area, the speech center of my brain. I actually still have a hole there, so that's my excuse. I have a hole in my brain. Well, I had seven days to lie in the hospital. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I crushed my own spirit. I broke my own life. I couldn't go back to work couldn't speak, lost my ability to sm smell, could barely walk, couldn't think straight, couldn't go back to school, lost my job, couldn't, didn't have any money to pay the bills because I'd been spending all my money on drugs be besides my, my rent and utilities. <coughs> I had destroyed everything in my life. I had nothing left. If my mom and dad who's sitting here, my mom is here with me today, if my mom and dad hadn't invited me into their home, I would have been homeless. These tender words, not just for me, but they are your words. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. 
I know some of your lives have been crushed these last two weeks. Literally. I know that you're brokenhearted and you're crushed in spirit, but hear this. The Lord is near you. Yahweh is near you. Jesus is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And then we come to the last section. Actually, I'll read through this real quick. Those words there and the words in the following section occur, show up in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And I'm just going to read these. They're worth reading. And then you can take a look at the whole chapter later on. It's all about persecution and holding up under persecution. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing for, and now we have, quoting from Psalm 34, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So now this psalm is brought into the new covenant and repeated. And I love those words. Be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, sisterly, kind-hearted and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. We are to bless those who persecute us. We are to pray for our enemies and love our enemies. And so you see these words in Psalm 34 reflected in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. I love those words, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and, save, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Then we move on to the last section of the psalm. Actually, this is part of that last section. It goes from 15 to, through 22. This is the second part of it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Under the old covenant, when they were living under the law, the promise was if, that if you live under the law and you keep the law, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivers them, him out of them all. For us in the New Covenant, because of those verses I've already quoted, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, and so on. We know that Paul, if we read in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, and we read that horrendous list of what he lived through, he delivers us out of them all, eternally, sometimes by taking us to heaven. And then it says, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. What a strange verse. It's just in the middle of this psalm, this verse appears, and it's like, what? David didn't have any bones broken by Saul. There was no beating or anything that happened with Saul, and none with uh, King Achish. Ak so what's this in there for? Well, we'll get there. We're almost done. Evil shall slay the wicked. Evil shall slay the wicked. And so the wicked's own evil, the consequences of their doing, will kill them. Hmm. Again, that's under the Old Covenant. But that is still true that the consequences of our sin will find us out. I still have consequences of a head injury. About 10 years ago, I started stuttering. And I didn't even notice it. I would say the same syllable two or three times. And so I saw my neurologist, Dr. Neocon, and he ordered an MRI. And that's when they saw that I still have that hole in my Broca's area, my speech center. I have scar tissue there. And so he says, you have little, what are they called? Seizures. seizures. Little miniature, little mini seizures that are going off in that area because of the because of the scar tissue and so that's causing the stuttering and there's not anything we can do for it we can give you meds but the side effects of the meds are worse than you're experiencing so it's just something i have to live with but there are consequences to our life 
to our sin. And that's why God warns us not to get into certain things, because he knows it's like Pandora's box. You will suffer the consequences. As Christians, we're not protected from consequences. Sometimes he will, but sometimes he lets us reap the full brunt of the consequences on top of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Who are the righteous now? Christians. And so those who hate Christians will be condemned. The only re remedy is to become a Christian yourself. Come out of your hatred and realize that this is truth. That Jesus really is the one through whom all things were created. The one in whom all things were holding together. The one who holds your life and my life together even now as I speak. And then the last verse. And here we have that verse out of order. You see... Tav is the last well, letter. It goes Resh, Shin, Tav. And then we have Pe, or Pe again. And Pe is much earlier in, in the alphabet. And why is that there at the end? We'll get there in a minute. It says the Lord redeems the soul, the soul of his servants. Well, that's true. Our souls have been redeemed. And none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. There's grace. There is a message of the gospel. We take refuge in Jesus, and he will redeem our soul. We see in John chapter 19, verses 31 through 35, we read these words, which quote from Psalm 34. Then the Jews, because it was a day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away prior to the Sabbath. They didn't want their bodies left up over Sabbath, and they could do no work on the Sabbath. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him, the one who had said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you before, or today you shall be with me in paradise. Now that man is dead by breaking his legs because they couldn't breathe anymore after that. I won't go into it. But one of the soldiers, oh, but when he, coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. There it is. They did not break his leg, legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen this has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. It says he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Right in the middle of this psalm is hidden this prophetic utterance, this prophetic verse, and it speaks of Jesus, that none of his bones were broken in his death. Now we see why that vav was left out and the pay put in. So you have, in verse 1, you have the aleph, which is the first letter. It's an A. I didn't tell you this when we're going through it, but in verse 11, that begins with Lamed and L, the Hebrew letter for L, and then it ends with this Pe, a P. Well, if you put those three letters together, and remember, Hebrew reads from right to left, like everything um, east of Israel, all those countries read from right to left instead of left to right. And so it's from the right, Aleph Lamed Pe, which is the spelling for, if you look at the top, Aleph. It's the, it's the spelling for the first letter of the alphabet. But it also spells, because they didn't have vowels, it also spelled the word Lop, that you didn't pronounce the A, so it was Lop. It's, we don't know how exactly how it was pronounced, but it was the, the, the word to teach. It's the verb to teach. So right built into the acrostic of this psalm is the word to teach. And what is he teaching? He's teaching the fear of the Lord. The, being awestruck by his presence. Being awestruck by his glory. Being awestruck by the glory we see in the face of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lama, lama sabachthani. 
I thirst. Woman, behold your son. Truly, truly, today you shall be with me in paradise. Into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. And Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All for love of you. All for love of this world. That you might come to know his sweet presence that will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I won't be back tomorrow. I'll be back on Sunday with our message returning to John chapter 4, verses 31, and I think it's through 38 this, this week. And the next week I'll be back again with uh, a psalm on Wednesday and Thursday. It'll be 35 and 36. And our Bible studies tonight at uh, 7 p.m., the link is there on our private page, or if you want to join us, you're welcome to. Just send me an email or a Facebook message or call me, and I can uh, send you the link to it. We're kind of being careful because um, here in Kitsap County, somebody hacked a children's program with pornography, and it was not good. And so we're, we're being very careful with our meetings. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for this wonderful psalm born out of David's encounter with King Achish, the Abimelech of the Philistines, as he f escaped from Saul. We never think of David as a poor man or an impoverished man, but he was impoverished. And yet he rises from there to being king. And we've been impoverished in our sin and we've been risen We've been raised from being sinners condemned to death to being children of the Most High God. Chosen and holy and dearly loved as we have come to believe in you. Born of the Spirit. Justified by faith, acquitted by faith. Given perfect peace with God our Father, we're no longer his enemy. Our only standing is grace. We're filled with the joy of the Lord. We've been given this peace that passes all understanding by giving you our worries and our anxieties. And you have given us eternal hope. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes, she who believes, has eternal life. Thank you that we are living eternally now. We pray for this world. We pray for our nation. We, again, commit this world into your hands. Thy will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Our blessing today is, is the end of the blessing we had yesterday from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Speaking to the Lord, Now to you who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in his peace and in his grace.